Basil, you ready? Uh, happy Monday, everybody. It's Chris Hewerts and Basil um, coming to you live from Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, super duper glad to um, see so many of you who've already joined us. I am, um, <laughs> this is not a joke. I have been on Zoom almost all damn day, nonstop. And uh, at one of like, in, you know, we always do these check-ins at, at these various meetings. And um, the last board call I was on, they, they, they just said two words, just what, what are your, your, what's your two word check-in? And I said, zoomed out and I'm zoomed out, but actually like seeing everybody here sort of populating the group, it's, um, it's actually giving me energy again. It's, it's quickly become a consolation. So I'm so happy y'all are here. I'm so happy y'all have joined us. Um, this is the second to last of our, our Monday wellness webinars, and um, today's going to be remarkable. I, I think you're going to find yourself um, encouraged and supported. I, I think you're going to find some really practical ways of, of finding your center and your grounding and, and loving your whole self and, and caring for your body. And that's been, um, I think, the, the challenge for a lot of us um, over these past few weeks. Um, I, I, I still... Am, am marveling over sort of my new relationship to time and, and how it, it just seems to, to completely be arbitrary. When I were talking yesterday and it was like, hey, do you, can you believe it was just one week ago exactly Sunday afternoon to Sunday afternoon? And like, didn't that week seem to go fast? Because the Sundays seemed almost smashed up against each other on my sort of calendar. But then I started thinking about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And again, it was like, wait, was that Monday last month or, 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 or six weeks ago? And so as we are, are, are kind of learning to relate to ourselves and, and time, um, I think there's, there's always this invitation to constantly return to the present. And today, that's why I'm thankful for this dog. Hazel has no idea about this pandemic, he has no idea about what's going on sort of out there in the, in the world. But um, he still invites me into presence and, and he invites me into this togetherness of, of, of being with him and, and with Melina. And, and that's what causes me, I think, to have such gratitude to see so many of you who continue to join us week after week. As I've also mentioned in, in a number of these webinars, um, man, I think I had to, to very quickly sort of self-correct. And, and there were things that I was, was doing to um, distract myself from the news. And so maybe some of us uh, binged on Tiger King. Um, for me personally, it was rewatching the the first two seasons of Westworld so I could get into this third season. And and I'm glad for for those kinds of distractions. But I think I'm I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more deliberate right now and, and and not go after distractions, but find replacements that are positive that are engaging. So I wanted to share this one with you. Um, got this in the mail last week. I'm not sure if any of you all um, see or subscribe to Enneagram Monthly. Um, it's kind of an ambitious title because this really only comes out about 10 times a year, but the cover article, The Whirling to Uncover Your Ennea Shadow, is from um, Samar Al-Gamal. She's an Egyptian journalist in Cairo, and um, she does a lot with the Sufi Enneagram, and it's absolutely remarkable. And so if you're not a subscriber to Enneagram Monthly, I'd just say um, chase that down. You can get a digital subscription, so they send you PDFs, and um, it's really, really great stuff. So want to um, kind of get back to the slide. I, I know I always do this and I know it's kind of goofy. Um, there's goofier things about me. So if this is one of them, um, I can live with it. But I do always love to sort of show us the who. And um, today we have folks um, registered from Australia, Canada, India. Um, somehow there's a, a family in Austria that, that has registered for almost all of these webinars and, and, and somehow your, your geotag or your location doesn't show up into there. So I'm sorry if I, I, I keep missing you. And then once again, we have folks from all over the, the US and um, I just really am, am, am thankful for each of you because again, this is kind of that, 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 that snapshot of the togetherness of us coming here three times a week for these wellness webinars. And, and, and I really do hope over in the chat, some of y'all are making connections um, and, I, and I really do hope that we can continue to find our way towards each other. Okay, so. Today, I'm gonna to turn this over to Flynn here really quick. I, I don't wanna really kill any time because um, we are super duper duper lucky um, to have Dr. Miravon with us. 
Um, she's also any and nerdy and uh, she's killing it out there in that space, but she's caring for, for herself, her family and, and for her community in ways that I think are, are admirable and exceptional. They're, they're remarkable. And I think it's going to be um, a, a real encouragement to y'all. So Helena, you there? Hi, Chris. Remember nice me? To, nice to see you rocking that uh, pink Himalayan sea salt lamp or whatever it is back there. You ever lick that just to sort of get a little spice in the day? Well, you know me, I do like salty things. So Actually, that's true. That's, yeah. that's, that is, that is true. It's, it's not, actually, it's not really salty though. We actually puts too not too much, but I'm shocked at how much salt she puts on the things that, that we eat. So maybe the doctor, the good doctor could also um, talk to you about your salt intake. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks All so right. much for hosting and facilitating these things. <laughs> so it's a joy. It's really a joy to be with you all again. Uh, thank you for showing up today and joining us. Uh, I'm sure some of you can relate to Chris's feeling of being zoomed out. Uh, and so we don't want to oversaturate you with Zoom uh, time, but we do want to be available for those who are needing some extra support around wellness during this COVID crisis. We are super happy to have Dr. Miravon with us, and I'm looking forward to introducing her to you. But before we do that, I just want to offer a little bit of uh, some breath work and a reading to help us transition from getting here to being here. So why don't we come into our seat in a mindful way? So just allowing your attention now to fall into your room where you are and your seat and make any adjustments that you need to so that you can be five to 10% more comfortable. And if you can let your body be upright your spine erect, and your chin slightly tucked. I thought we'd do a few rounds of square breathing today. And so if you're unfamiliar with square breathing, let me just briefly explain that to you. So if you can imagine a square, and if I had two other visuals here, I could show you the full square. But the way this works is that on the uh, verticals, we will inhale and exhale, and on the parallel lines, we will hold. And so it looks something like this, where we inhale to the count of four, and then we'll hold to the count of four, and then we'll exhale to the count of four, and we'll hold again to the count of four. And so I'll prompt you something like this, where I'll invite you to inhale two, three, four, hold two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. And in that way, we will give our nervous system a, a little bit of an oxygen bath and allow everything to grow calm and uh, deepen our capacity to be present to our time together. And so with your eyes gently open if you need the visual with me or gently closed and just concentrating on the sound of my voice let's do two cleansing breaths together here inhaling deeply from the belly and exhale through the mouth inhale once more through the nose Exhale completely through the mouth. And just take a moment to let your breath return to its normal function. And then we'll breathe together here. Ready, inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Four. Inhale, 
two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. One more time. Inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. And just letting your breath return to its normal function here. Just deepening your awareness of the inhale and exhale. Just noticing the breath as it moves in and down, up and out. I'm reading today from the Prayers of Honoring Grief by Pixie Lighthorse. And we'll be sure and include the information about this reading in the show notes um, and in the follow-up email that you'll receive tomorrow. This is a prayer for honoring transmutation. Thank you for helping me see my broken pieces as beautiful and worthy. Thank you for helping me lay into the earth what has become oppressive on my soul and for helping me see the importance in my courage to feel. Scrub my body, heart, and mind of their accumulated stresses and unaddressed anguish. Let me stop the abuses and misfortunes from telling my future. Help me author my personal story of strength and perseverance while ripening me for rebirth. Let me strip off unwanted debris with my hands and behold how feasible it is for me to move my own energy. Help me see my offerings like fallen leaves that nourish the bustling, hungry communities of unseen beneficials living below the surface. Let the intensity of the weight I've been carrying feed the soil of my spirit. Help me plant the seeds of tomorrow's wellness and water them with my tears. Let every creaking wail of sorrow be an investment in the freedom of tomorrow. When my griefs begin to release, let me feel the lightning of my heart like a dandelion setting free its seed wishes. Let these composted traumas and hopes for the future quell my desire for an endless summer. Cover them gently in preparation for nature's season of reflection and restoration. Open me to recurrent occasions of self-cleaning self -cleaning for my giving spirit, body, and mind, the precious attention it is asking for. Make me an enthusiastic gardener for my well-being. Fill me with willingness to allow downtime when I have done what I can do for now. I trust you to finish the job in my dreams while I rest. So it's my privilege to introduce you today to Dr. Miravon. Dr. Miravon is joining us from sh the Chicago suburbs. She's married with two children. And in addition to being a naturopathic and chiropractic physician, she's also an, a home educator of her two children. Miravon graduated um, from the fully accredited postgraduate program in chiropractic and naturopathic medicine at National University of Health Sciences. She has additional postgraduate training in pediatrics, nutrition, and functional rehabilitation, as well as various myofascial techniques. Within all of her experiences, her passion for finding the root cause grew and she made necessary changes in her own life. And this has fully experienced, um, this has helped her to fully experience really the power of holistic medicine. She's taken a special interest in being a mental health advocate and seeking true healing through modalities such as herbs, nutraceuticals, lifestyle changes, meditation, and personal growth work. And so it is my privilege and joy to introduce Dr. Miravon to you. And if you would like to turn on your camera now and join us here, Miravon, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for 
taking time out of your full schedule to be with us today. I'm so honored. I really am. I love that Chris referred to me as an Indian nerd. I take that as a, as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> above, above everything else, I'm an Indian nerd. That's awesome. Yeah, we like Indian nerds. <laughs> so, Miravan, would you uh, share with our guests today a little bit about your practice and uh, your, your practice in functional medicine? Maybe uh, even define for us what functional medicine is. Describe your practice and how it's evolved over the years. Uh, so I um, started my graduate degree studying chiropractic medicine, which is pretty known uh, in terms of physical medicine. So I worked with athletes at different colleges in our area, and I just didn't feel like I loved it. It was fun, but it was kind of the same thing all the time. And I'm only... 5'4", and I'm, uh, it, it, I was working on guys that were six feet tall. So it was just getting tiring for me. So I went back and I uh, was doing my, I, I really just searched my soul really and found that naturopathic medicine is really at the heart of what I do. And a lot of people have never heard that term. So naturopathic medicine is really looking at the body as a whole and trying to find the root cause of what's going on. And we do that, um, some of us do prescribe medication, so it's not really about being against medication or of any, in any way, but we do it by trying to utilize nature. So supplements, herbs, homeopathy, in a way to kind of enhance the body's innate ability to heal. And that is, that's been really my life's calling. It's been amazing to kind of be able to help fill in the pieces for people. And functional medicine is really a good example would be something, a diagnosis such as IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. A lot of people will go, you know, to the depths of going to a GI doctors of different kinds and, and finding that, oh, you just have IBS, just take this medication pretty much for the rest of your life for symptom control. But they're still dealing with the stress of it, the pain, the um, other external symptoms that come from it other than just the GI tract. So when they come to a functional medicine doctor, we're looking at trying to restore function because a diagnosis like that is basically a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning there was nothing else anatomically or physiologically wrong. And we're looking at really the small details of like things like your stress having a huge issue on how you digest food or the quality of food that you're eating or potentially food sensitivities. So we're looking at much deeper, really narrow crevices really to find out what is giving you these symptoms under this huge umbrella of a diagnosis such as IBS. And what I get to do that I love is, and I think what naturopathic doctors are superior in, is we individualize care. So I don't use protocols. When people come in, I just listen to their story and I try to fill in the blanks where they haven't been seen or they haven't been heard. Um, and sometimes that is going beyond lab results. And sometimes that is going beyond imaging to kind of find out where can we restore some function. So that's kind of a yeah, that's so interesting to me. You know, this, um, this part about like really seeing and hearing your patients, because as I've been uh, trying to figure out how to manage my own response and reaction to this COVID-19 uh, crisis, I came across an article uh, that named this very thing being seen and heard as key to resilience. Can you speak to what you've seen in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on your practice and, and how um, seeing and hearing your patients has, has been important for their own resilience during this time? Yeah, so I'll t go a little bit back to how my practice has transformed because as a new doc, I was focused on just physical symptoms for people. And although I knew the mind and the body had a huge connection, I was just looking at lab results for patients and how can I get rid of their headaches and how can I get rid of their thyroid condition or their postpartum issues and so forth. Um, but it wasn't till I was hit with severe postpartum depression about four years ago after my second child that I realized that I was at the most fit in my life. I was doing triathlons, half marathons, 
running a private practice, volunteering, homeschooling my kids. My life was moving at a very high speed. And to me and to a lot of what society says about us is that that is healthy. If you can do all those things and do all of them and do them well, you must be doing something right. But I was, I was struggling and suffering. And then I had to really ask myself, how am I not immune to this? I eat right, I take supplements and all of that. And it was really until I dug into my own personal growth of revisiting childhood trauma, trying to focus on really healing my inner soul child till I was able to really connect with patients a lot more. And even though I could empathize with them prior to my own experience, it was, it, my, the, the connection was deeper. I would have patients walk into my office and meet me for the first time. And all I did was listen before I even gave them a, a plan. And they would tell me that they already felt hope. Wow. And that to me, what is resiliency on both ends of being able to um, be in the presence of someone hurting and in pain and, and knowing what you can do, but sometimes just listening. And with COVID, my practice has had to transform to telemedicine. So it's, it's a lot more, it's not as personal and it's obviously just through, through a Zoom call. And I was a little bit nervous about that of, you know, usually part of the healing for a lot of my patients is being it with me in a room and just feeling the energy that I'm there for them. And, uh, but it, it's not so much that it's not so much that way, you know, just actually being able to reassure them, talk to them about some facts. There's a lot of confusing things out there about what COVID is, how it affects the body, what they can do. Um, so just hearing them and being, you know, I'm a very direct person and in a professional setting that really works for people because that's what they're hiring me for. So it's, I've seen the same thing, which is great. I've seen the resiliency come out of people almost feeling like, like I can visualize this baggage, this weight off, lifted off their shoulders because I just listened and I just talked and I was able to reassure them. And if I couldn't reassure them, I was able to direct them to resources to do their own, uh, their own research or their own learning. Cause it's, it's a very, it's confusing for all of us, even, even for me, you know, it's confusing for all of us of what's really happening in the world. And so I've seen a lot of resiliency in my patients. It's been really remarkable to even um, sit in that with them. And uh, I mean, inspiring to me really. And Enneagram wise, it's always when people come in self-identified, it's always interesting too, to kind of observe how our lens of the world has really affected how we do see and process COVID. And even being able to discuss some of that with them on a very uh, superficial way or somewhat it's um, there's healing there you yeah. know so I know yeah I know in my own experience um, meeting with functional medicine physicians and healthcare providers that it's it's been it's been a fairly um, dramatic difference in my experience with um, from from uh, conventional medical doctors uh, the the time and attention that's given um, to myself as a person, and, um, and then the thoroughness by which the functional medicine physician has has uh, addressed my overall health and wholeness, and looking at the root cause of of various struggles that I've had um, has has really has been such a positive experience for me. I'm realizing that some of our guests today might not have any experience at all with physicians outside of the conventional medical doctor route. I wonder if you could briefly summarize for folks um, how you would describe um, the difference in education that mm -hmm. goes behind um, a healthcare provider from your training versus a medical doctor training that most people are pretty aware of. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, we all have bachelor's degrees. So most of us have bachelor's degrees in science of some kind. I have it in biomedical science. So I do have a bachelor's degree. And then on top of that, uh, for, for just chiropractic, so there are some functional medicine doctors that are 
not naturopaths, you know, they're chiropractors only. Uh, chiropractic school is about 10 trimesters long. So that ends up, if you were to uh, go straight through, that's about three and a half years. If you were to split it up, that's about five years. We have a clinical that's in that uh, as well. And naturopathic school is the same. So it's about 10 trimesters long as well. We have residency programs, but they are not required. So there, there's a big difference there. In traditional medical school, there is a required residency, depending on the specialty that you want to enter. And that is in order to be able to practice outside. Uh, we can practice as soon as we graduate. We have a, the clinicals, like I said, but we only have optional residencies. And there's not, there's not a ton of them, so it's very competitive. In terms of our education, we pretty much for the first half of our school schooling is very similar to medical school in terms of just the physiology, neurology, anatomy, all of those things. Um, we do, you know, for a whole year, pretty much dissect the entire cadaver um, fresh all the way through. So we get that experience as well. And then halfway through, we do have pharma, like, pharmacology, we don't have heavy pharmacology because we don't have prescription rights. Or I don't have prescription rights in this state, in Illinois, but in Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Vermont, they have prescription rights. So they will have to do, if you practice in those states, you have to do licensing exams and all of that uh, to be able to prescribe and continue education for pharmacology. But otherwise, we have way heavier courses on herbs, uh, supplements, physiology based on homeopathy, things like that. So we spend much more time doing that, whereas, whereas in traditional med medical school, they don't. That is more continuing education for them if they're interested to learn about herbs and all of that. We do have a lot of classes with drug and herb interactions. So I am a herb person. I've That's been where my heart is. So drug herb interactions are really important. And so we have a lot of classes on that as well. Totally. Wonderful. No, that's great. Thank you very much for uh, going, going through all of that. There might be, um, if you think of a website or something that people might be able to look at that could help them dive further into exploring the differences um, between the different kinds of, of physicians, I think that could be helpful for people. But all of that to say, um, it seems to me in my experience, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in my experience with functional medicine, um, doctors, um, herbalists, uh, chiropractors. I've worked with um, various alternative, as they say, alternative medicine here in, in our country. Um, and what, what my experience has been is that the focus is very much on, like you mentioned in the beginning, getting to the root cause of dis-ease, whatever that dis-ease might be in the body, in the mind, uh, and, and helping the, the patient heal from a holistic standpoint rather than just focus on on managing a symptom is that is that a general way to distinguish between the two yeah so i think it's important to manage symptoms to some degree because of comfort and you know um all of that especially if someone's in chronic pain or, or anything but even really at the depth of it is that i what i tell patients is i don't want you to need me anymore the whole point of it is for me to give you the tools to educate you and that you need me when you see me. In the beginning of that, we're seeing each other often. And then beyond that, I'm, I'm kind of just a cheerleader on the side, yeah. you know, just kind of rooting you on. Um, but the whole point of it is so that you don't need me. Yeah. I noticed in your bio how you, um, you referenced this ideology around doctor as teacher, that you really emphasize this idea of being an educator with your patients. I love that. And I wonder if, um, if at this point in our time together, before we move into question, um, questions from our guests, from our audience, I wonder if you could educate us a little bit, be our teacher and talk to us about resources, you know, especially as they apply to uh, the COVID-19 crisis that we're facing. And um, I'm particularly interested in, and given my interaction with a lot of the folks who've been attending our webinar, if you could address resources as they might relate to like depression, anxiety, and fatigue. Uh, Cause I know a lot of folks are struggling with that because of this crisis. Yeah, absolutely. So I wrote 
um, a whole list of things on my, my professional Instagram um, or my Facebook page. So we can link that eventually too. Um, and I'm gonna, so I'm going to go through that kind of that post and kind of weave in some of my own narrative about the, the depression and anxiety piece too, which I think is important. So with COVID-19, I don't want to really specifically talk about how it infects a cell and all of that, but I am going to throw out some terms uh, that are very specific to COVID-19. Um, and one of the things that people hear a lot is how it affects NF-kappa B, which is which is what is going to cause an inflammatory storm to happen, which is how COVID-19 really really when it infect, infects a cell kind of propels the infection forward and the virus kind of lives in the body at that point. And so if most people may be heard at this point that kids have less of an issue with infection than adults and people always wonder why that is. And they have seen because melatonin in kids is usually higher. So melatonin for, for humans, are, it's made in the dark, complete darkness. And a lot of us use screens to fall asleep or we're reading before bed and we have the light on and all of that. We don't have a really great functioning bedtime routine, adults, you know, but kids, our kids have great bedtime routines, right? We wind them down, read them a story, turn the lights down low. So they have this defense mechanism just naturally. And so sleep is really important and it really is because it inhibits the NF kappa B activation inflammasome kind of activation that happens that really causes the virus to dig deeper. So something as simple as sleep is really important. And I don't push melatonin a ton because there's a dependency on that. But if someone were to have sleep issues, especially during this time, it might not be a bad idea. And you know, you don't want to go over 10 milligrams, but it might not be a bad idea to think about that. Um, stress management is obviously something that's going to be really, really important because of cortisol. And so instead of thinking of new projects to do or things to do around the house or a new book to write or something like that, <laughs> it's, it's really what I'm trying to encourage patients to do is dig into something like meditation or taking a walk or nature therapy, something that slows you down and allows you to kind of dig deeper into yourself to be able to help regulate some of the stress that you have, depending on where you are. I do think the Enneagram is really amazing to think about our stress management, because if you really study the Enneagram, you kind of, you know, we, what I love about the Enneagram is that the centers of intelligence, the head, the heart, and the body, right? I'm body dominant. And being in this uh, time, I've had to be centered more in my head and my heart, which for my Enneagram number is not fun. <laughs> so that's, there's a lot of work there, but I have found that digging into those centers that I kind of just, you know, push aside and then connecting my body, it's amazing how freeing it really, really can be. Um, so stress management is really important. And then we're going to get into kind of the things that everyone wants to hear, right? The things like the, the supplements. So vitamin C is huge. It's so hard to find vitamin C right now. Uh, but vitamin C is huge because they actually used IV vitamin C in China to treat patients with severe symptoms. And they've seen a lot of positive results. Uh, so the thing with vitamin C, though, is people take way too much at once. So what I say is we, we absorb about 500 milligrams to 1000 milligrams at once. So to be able to take that amount over a whole day, maybe three times a day is really important so that you're not actually just, um, you're not taking too much and wasting it. So I encourage, vitamin C is great. You don't want to drink a ton of orange juice because there's a lot of you know, that, that's not, you're not going to get enough vitamin C that way. You're going to want to take the capsule or the powder form of it. So I'm, I'm curious, are you saying to take 500 to 1,000 milligrams to split up throughout the day or like one dose is okay? One dose of 500 to 1,000 milligrams is about how much we can absorb before we basically pee it out. So you're going to want to take 500 milligrams maybe three times a day, four times a day. Uh, depending on your tolerance. Some people can't tolerate it bowel-wise. It can hurt their stomach. So you, you want to start at 500 and maybe go up to 1,000. Oh, okay, but not take 1,000 all at one time. You, you could. You don't want to okay. go above that. Okay, got yeah. it. 
Mm-hmm. Got it. Then your money's literally going in the toilet. So that's what I tell my patients is you don't want to waste a good thing. Yeah. Um, the next thing that's been really helpful is zinc. So zinc actually has been seen to inhibit coronaviruses. I'm talking about coronaviruses in general, not, not COVID, but uh, coronaviruses into the cells. It, it appears to actually reduce the virus's ability to attach. So zinc isn't um, something that we should take all the time chronically, but in this period of time, I'm encouraging patients, kids that, you know, kids could take anywhere from 15 milligrams and adults could go up to 30 or 45 milligrams. So all this information is on that Instagram post um, that, or my Facebook page, if anybody's not writing fast enough, or if you have any questions or you want me to slow down, let me know. So vitamin D and elderberry, these have come up to be very controversial in relation to COVID-19. And elderberry, people may know or may not know, but elderberry has been seen to potentially cause a cytokine storm, which is very similar to what the coronavirus is already kind of doing in the body. So it's very controversial. I'm not saying that that actually happens. We have herbalists on one end and, and other physicians on one end. And so what I say is I'm kind of trying to build that bridge that I think it is beneficial to prevent, but not to treat. So if you know that you have COVID or if you expect that you do, I would say to probably just stay away from it just to be safe, you know? Um, But if you're using it to prevent, I think it's powerful. Elderberry is great. So, you know, adults can do anywhere from 10 to 60 milliliters and then kids can do like a teaspoon or so. Uh, Vitamin D, same thing. So it's gonna reduce some inflammasome activation, which is uh, s- specific to COVID, but that the it can also activate it can also activate it. So what I tell people with vitamin D is you want I can't really say dosage because you want to get your vitamin D levels measured so that you don't overdose, um, but also that you have to kind of relate it to if you do have symptoms specific to COVID that vitamin D has been been kind of controversial right now but i love vitamin d it's a happy it's a it's the happy pill you know and so i'm not i'm not one to kind of go against that too much but i just want to be transparent um the other the last thing that has been really good is vitamin a so if you're pregnant or if you have liver issues you cannot do the high dose vitamin a um because it is it is it's not going to be really helpful in pregnancy. And when I mean high dose, I'm talking about 25,000 I use. So a really high dose, not, not uh, what's in your multivitamin. But this one is amazing to be antiviral. So it's actually great to treat. So if you do end up having symptoms of even a cold or even all the way to COVID, it's an amazing one to use to treat. The symptoms. And then obviously diet. Diet is always going to be the foundation. You know, people um, have, you know, quarantine diet. I'm hearing a lot of that. And I think it's okay to have some of that balance, to have some comfort, but I think we also still have to be able to uh, focus on the foods that are going to give us life and give our body uh, nutrition and healing and all of that. So diet's a really huge one that I think people forget about, you know, vegetables and fruits, like whole, um, not a lot of the canned stuff, like just get your veg- get your produce delivered or something if you don't wanna go out. Um, but I think that we have to kind of focus on diet. Excellent, thank you. Those are all super good resources. Chris put, uh, put a link to your social media on Instagram in the chat. So if the attendees want to check that out, but we'll also make sure that this is included in the email uh, that we'll send out tomorrow for resources and um, in the show notes when this uh, video recording is posted on our Vimeo page. So if you didn't get all of that, we'll be sure that you have a a reference link um, to come back to it later. In the meantime, I want to prepare the attendees uh, for some Q&R with you. And so if, um, if anyone is interested in interacting with Miravan, uh, with Dr. Miravan, if you would raise your hand, then I'm gonna call on you. I'll see if you're uh, open to coming on video. If not, we'll just use your microphone. But uh, while you all are thinking about that, thinking about raising your hand, there's a, a question in the chat. And um, I would ask that if, 
that, that no one else post questions in the chat because we're now going to transition to microphones or videos with our, with our guests or our attendees. But I do wanna to touch on this question that I saw here. Um, this is from Elizabeth. She's asking, can you speak a little bit about stress, anxiety, eating? I want to eat better at home, but in reality, I have cravings and eat worse. I'm an Enneagram five and go to seven in stress. What would you say? Um, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that right now, a lot of people are eating their emotions, you know? And so I, I even tell, I even tell pregnant women this, um, if you have a craving to be able to tell yourself that you can have it and control your portion. And I would say that to, you know, anybody else who's not pregnant is really, I mean, there's a reason that you're connected to that. But I think what happens with cravings is we actually overindulge. We actually turn a craving, which is very small into an entire meal or, you know, and then we kind of just swim in all of that. And then we have a lot of regret and shame and guilt surrounded in that. And that's, that's that evil cycle of that behavioral, you know, negative behavioral eating. So I, always say a support system is really good. Accountability is really good. Um, if you live with somebody else, I think it's great to have someone for you to verbally express that you have a craving or that you need to be kept accountable. And I think that's really great because I think we think we're bigger than our cravings or we're bigger than what we, you know, are, we're bigger than that. And we're really not. I mean, it is a part of who we, we are. And so in a long way to kind of answer that is really, you're going to have to try to find ways to work on the self-control piece of that. Right. And so that might mean to be able to tell someone that you live with or a friend that you, you know, you're trying to be better about certain things, or that might mean you have you fulfill that craving, but you control how much you have, you make a small amount of it, and then you can feel satisfied in that, you know, so that one's a, it's, that one's a little tough because cravings can definitely be physiological, meaning some, some neurotransmitters or, or things that can be off as well that we can also work on on a deeper level, but on a, on a superficial level, you're going to have to come up with some accountability practice of some kind or mindfulness, and then it's okay to give yourself some of that, some of that, but then also know that, you know, you can limit and have some self-control as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Maravan. I'm going to call on Libby here. Let me just turn on your microphone, Libby. Can you hear me, Libby? Hello? You might need to unmute your mic. Okay. Now there. can you hear me? Yes. And would you like to come on video? That's fine. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, move you over here to panelists and see if you can turn on your camera now. Let's see. Okay, it says I can't start video. Let me try it again. No, it's not letting me do it. That's all right. We can hear you, so go right ahead. Okay. Um, I have, a, I have a question, but there's three questions that are involved in the one question and I wrote it down so that I could, um, keep it succinct instead of rambling. <laughs> but yeah. what are your thoughts about disease being caused by our inner emotions and, um, by, um, any trauma that's going on in our life? And how do you explain this to your patients if, if it's something you believe in? And can you help them to identify the emotions or situations that might be causing the pain? And if so, how do you do that? That's a really good question. So I use this weird visual of an artichoke with all my patients. Uh, <laughs> we're peeling back the layers and getting kind of to the heart of the problem. And because of my own experience and being a mental health advocate, I have seen that the root cause has is always is not always, but is, is very truly tied to the traumas, unresolved traumas, emotions, or anxiety or underlying depression. Obviously, there's a lot of mental, emotional conditions out there that I'm not, I'm not talking about, but that I do find in, in my demographic of patients that that is a very true thing. And 
a lot of it, I spend about my first visit with patients is 90 minutes. So that's a long time to be spent with someone and, and a lot longer than a lot of people are used to with medical professionals. And in that 90 minutes, I'm building a lot of rapport with patients and I'm hearing their story and patients are crying in my office and they're pouring their heart out. And sometimes the answer lies within what they're already saying. And right. all I do is kind of be able to bring that back up into the forefront for them. And they really kind of come to their own awareness and consciousness of it on their own, which is really an amazing thing to witness. When, I, when that doesn't happen, it is something that I bring up. Um, and I co-manage with therapists, counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists of all kinds, because it's that important that a lot of our unresolved traumas and emotional, you know, inner emotional um, beatings that our inner child has taken, that really does have physical manifestations as well as the other way around. Physical manifestations are actually continually abusing our inner child. So I believe that that kind of that energy kind of goes back and forth. And so with working with patients, we're able to identify that. And then with working with a therapist, it's amazing how much you can unlock when you work with a therapist and even an Enneagram coach on top of that. And, and really the connection we all can have together can really be life-changing for a patient. Thank you, that was great. I never thought about physical illness causing, I mean, abuse for our inner child. I'll have to think about that one some more. Mm. It's a good remark. Yes, thank you so much uh, for your question, Libby. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to give a chance for, for others before we run out of time. So let me just see who's raising their hand here. Angie, I'm going to call on you. Hi, Angie. Can you hear me? You might need to unmute your microphone. Let's see. I'm in trouble here. Angie, are you there? Hmm, Angie, can you unmute your microphone? It's not, doesn't wanna, I'm in trouble here. Um, Angie, are you there? Okay, Angie, why don't you, uh, Go ahead and put in the chat box your question. I don't know why the microphone's not working. I can talk a little bit about, I forgot to uh, talk about the depression anxiety piece and some resources. So as she's writing that question, I can kind of talk about that real quick. Great. Um, but uh, I, I talk about it from a place of knowing that there are people that take medication and all of that. So I'm not against any of that, but also to bring awareness that if you are going to look into more natural ways to treat mental, emotional conditions that you don't want to mix them. So that's something that you really do need to work on with a prescribing doc, uh, that you don't want to mix natural remedies with medications. So beyond that, aside from doing personal growth work, getting into the Enneagram, if that's something that you like, uh, professional health from, uh, you know, mental health specialists, I often find really huge links to hormonal disruptions, pre-existing thyroid conditions, neurotransmitter imbalances, chronic pain to be really big catalysts for um, exacerbations for depression and anxiety. So herbs for me are life-changing. And so things like rhodiola, ashwagandha, uh, Siberian ginseng paired with like 5-HTP, which is actually a precursor for serotonin uh, can be really, really powerful. I have a lot of women in my practice and, um, you know, cause women, we are very much in tune with our bodies and how we feel. And I have found a lot of interaction with cortisol, which is our stress hormone, as well as, uh, you know, in the imbalances of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So a lot of it is working with those balances of those things tied to even our thyroid hormones too. It's very, com it can be very complex and all of those things can be again, at part of the heart of the artichoke that I talked about, at being at that kind of the inner being of um, our depression and anxiety. And it's not that depression and anxiety is all just mental. I think that there's so many physical things, physiologically, uh, chemically, that can be off balance in our body, which I think vitamin D, sunlight, nature, uh, nature therapy, a lot of people are getting into CBD, 
CBD has been very life-changing for a lot of my patients, uh, but it's, it, it also has a lot of uh, high medication interactions. So, you know, we got to be mindful of that. And really, it's, it's really what I'm getting back to is getting back to the root cause of why you're depressed or why you suffer with anxiety. And that's really addressing the synergistic energy that ha can happen using herbs, supplements, lifestyle changes. And, and that's how we can connect the mind and the body. So that's a little bit about that. It's like awesome. a big puzzle for me, you know, and I, I love to be able to sift through that, but it's definitely um, finding the missing piece. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to see, I don't see Angie's question. I'm just going to see Angie, if I can unmute you, but doesn't seem to be working. Um, is there, we probably have time for one more question. If anybody else would like to raise their hand and I can call on you. Uh, let's see. Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, Felina. How are you? Doing okay, thanks. Would, would it be okay if we bring you over into the video? Absolutely. Okay, here we go. All right, can you, uh, let's see if we can get you to turn the video on on your side. Oh, I see it. Start video. This is there. Oh, and apparently I have the Aurora Borealis behind me. <laughs> nice. Not, not sure how I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to look at that. It distracts me. So, um, I'm just curious if, if vitamin C is hard to find and zinc and look at, like, where do we find these supplements right now? That's a really good question. So they're not hard to find. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Uh, so I have a dispensary for patients that I use. Um, a lot of people are going straight to the companies. So Thorne is a company I use. That's T-H-O-R-N-E. Um, Ortho Molecular is another company. Um, Designs for Health is another company I really trust. You can actually go to their websites and inquire about how to order those supplements if, if you can't go in the stores and find them yourself. Um, everything is just on back order and the shipping has been delayed. It, you can find it. It's just going to take a little bit of time before you, before you're able to get your hands on it. So that, you know, I, I mean, can you, you know, I know Sam's Club and Walgreens and stuff has supplements. I mean, is that just not good if they have that? Is that better than nothing? It's better than nothing. Um, I can give you, you can actually request to get added on my dispensary as well too. So you don't have to okay. be, you don't have to be a patient of mine. And it's really, you're just basically ordering from a big dis distribution company, but I trust those brands definitely. And so I'm picky about it with my patients, but in the world that we're in now, it's really getting your hands on any vitamin C would be great. It's all ascorbic acid, which is the, the, the type of vitamin C that you're going to find. Um, it's just getting your hands on it, I think is important. So if you get it at Costco, get it at Costco. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah. I'm going to figure out how to get rid of the Aurora Borealis. <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's good to see you, Elizabeth. Thanks Likewise. for your question. Thanks, Lena. Thanks. All right. We, um, want to, we want to take this last question from Michelle. But before we do, um, could you say briefly, Dr. Miravan, uh, uh, could you say something briefly about the standards related to supplements? This might be interesting for folks. Like you said, the, there are some companies that you trust, others not so much. Could you just say a little something about that for consumers to be more informed? So my, my reason to be a little bit more picky is really looking at the quality of the supplements and if your body's absorbing them. And also really, um, because supplements are so trendy in general, we're, we're getting a lot of uh, supplement companies that are coming out and filling and adding a lot of fillers. So I always tell people, if you go and look at the label of it and buy the most purest form of that version of that supplement and look at the other ingredients label. If you see a really long list there, it's probably not a great idea. You know, you're getting a bunch of fillers and your, your money is not really going that far. 
Um, so that's why I use the companies I use because I trust them. I know what they use and, the, and, and what kind of, you know, capsules they use and all of that. I also urge people to go for capsule, powder, or liquid over tablets. Tablets are extremely difficult to make and they're usually, um, they're usually very highly processed and have a ton of fillers and your body may or may not really absorb them that well. So if you're looking for supplements, looking for capsule, powder, or liquid is going to be the best bet, really. Thank you for that. Okay, Michelle. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Michelle? Yes, you are. Hi. Would you mind coming over into video? That's fine. Okay, let me get you over here. Let's see if we can get your video turned on. Do you see any changes there, Michelle? I've lost her. <laughs> uh, Michelle, are you there? Hmm. Michelle, I think we've, we've lost you. Let's see. Let's just, um, Michelle, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Michelle? Hello, Michelle, can you hear me? We've lost her. I don't know what happened. We, we don't normally have these, these problems. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, we're running out of time so i think we're gonna have to bring this to a close unless michelle comes on oh she it dropped via cell phone she says okay well um because of the time we want to be sure um that we try to end on time for for everyone's um schedule and all that so chris i'm going to invite you back uh Oh, let's see. Michelle's asking, can your energy tell what nutrients you need? Are you, are you referring to applied kinesiology? Is that, is that something that you're referring to? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. So I am not going to speak on that a ton because I don't do it. I don't have a ton of education in it. I do have colleagues that have continuing education in it and they find it very effective and it works very well for their patients. It's just not my method of uh, picking supplements. And so I respect it. It's just not anything that I'm really familiar with, but that's a good question. But I would say AK, you'd have to go to an AK specialist. Thank you, Michelle. I'm glad you were able to get your question in. Yeah, and good. thank you, Dr. Miravon. It's so yeah. nice to have you with us today. Really, this has been invaluable for our, for our people, for me. Uh, and so we're going to make sure that we get as many of those resources, as you mentioned, um, linked to the email that will go out for everyone tomorrow. Yes, and I loved it. I loved it. I, I'm very honored. And so thank you mm -hmm. so much to you and Chris for doing all the work that you guys do mm -hmm. and for being an inspiration to all of us. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And so with that, we'll turn this show back over to Chris. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Mervon and uh, Basil. Uh, speaking of uh, body clocks and kids knowing when to go to bed and adults not always knowing, this guy swear to God knows at five o'clock, he's ready to get out of here. And so to honor your time, just want to thank you all for, for joining us. Um, we're really down to um, after today's webinar, um, our last three that, that we've committed to in April, we'll, we'll come back again on Wednesday for guided meditation, contemplative practice. Um, we'll come back on Friday with Gabe's Torres, a singer songwriter from the Philippines and a mental health professional. And um, that's going to be remarkable. And then um, a week from today, Dr. Ying Gao, one of our, our, our board members, will, will, will kind of wrap out this month's wellness webinar. Um, as long as we're unable to, to meet here at, at Gravity for our Wednesday meditation sits, we'll, we'll try to bring those um, online to, to just offer guided practice and, and a time to connect. But really, thank you all so much for um, showing up. Thank you for, for, for staying connected. Um, your commitment to your own health and, and well-being is um, a collective commitment that helps carry us all. And, and it really does go a long way and it really does mean a ton. So take care of yourselves, take care of your hearts, 
Um, I'm going to put a slide up here just to remind you of the last three webinars. And uh, thanks for joining us all. Basil, say see. Oh, little grooming over there. Going to give him some privacy. Um, have a great, have a great week, everybody.